and let them have dominion. The kingdom of God is within people. It's the advancement of the people that is advancement because of the kingdom. Because faith must be backed by the assignment of this ministry is found from that verse. Where we You're on to a word encounter as Pastor David Ogweli ministers God's word to you with simplicity and power. God bless you. He created them to control the earth, to control the circumstances on earth, just like God controls the heavenly. Just lift our hands and just honor the Lord. Father, we honor you tonight. We bless you. We thank you for bringing us again together in this place. To come and tarry in your presence. To come and be with you. To come and seek your face. To come and seek your counsel. We come into your presence. Realizing that you have made us priests and kings unto our God. We take on our priestly office in this hour. I ask for the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on Calvary to cleanse everyone here tonight. Everyone that will be part of this weekend event. Puge our conscience from every dead works purge every family purge every ministry purge every individual I sprinkle the blood of the everlasting covenant on my conscience on my spirit on my soul on my mind on my being on my body Father, we sprinkle it upon every living person that is here tonight. Every person. All the brethren that, brethren that are going to be traveling to be part of this weekend conference. We hook them in. Into the ministry of our high priest. And Father, tonight, Lord... We ask for the cleansing of this atmosphere. This whole environment. We consecrate this ground as holy ground. We consecrate this place as a place of divine encounter. Where you will manifest yourself to men and women. And now Lord, anoint everyone. Anoint our ears. Anoint our eyes anoint our minds anoint our hearts anoint every one of us to be able to function as priests and as prophets to be able to hear the voice of god to be able to see into the realm of the spirit and understand what the holy spirit is saying in this hour remove the veils from our eyes remove the wax that have blocked our ears remove the hardness of our hearts Father, your word will not come on fallow ground. We ask for every fallow aspect of our heart to be broken up by the power of your spirit. We ask that everything that has blocked us, everything that has hindered us, everything that has limited us, everything that has dulled us, everything that has made us ineffective like we should, everything that has made us dull of perception, dull of seeing, by the power of the blood of Jesus and by the workings of the Holy Spirit. Let it be removed tonight, Lord my God. Let the eyes of your people be open to see. Let our ears be open to hear. Let our hearts be quickened to perceive what the Holy Spirit is saying in this hour. Everything the enemy has done in any life anything he has done in any family everything he has done in every church or ministry represented here let it be destroyed tonight my god whatever he has stolen whatever he has removed whatever he has robbed your people of let it be restored back tonight my god put back whatever the enemy has taken out 
take out what enemy, whatever the enemy has put in. Every tree that my father did not plant shall not stand. Let the axe be laid at the root of such plantings, satanic plantings, satanic establishments, satanic arrangements, satanic relationships, satanic networks, satanic ideas, satanic revelations, satanic understanding, satanic mindset, satanic inhibitions and, and roadblocks. Let it be moved out of the way tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. Let the mountains be brought low. Let the valleys be filled up. Let the crooked places be made straight. Let the rough places be made smooth. Let an expressway be opened for the glory of God to be revealed in every life. Open up your mouth and talk to the Lord because you don't carry things over. If those things that are wrong with your life, this is the right time to sort them out. And some of them are things to repent of. You have to ask for the blood of Jesus to walk on you or you are not going to get anywhere. You can be in this meeting. And at the end of it, you have not made anywhere. The ministry of a priest begins with the offering of the blood. Without it, nothing else works. It is when the blood has done its work that the Holy Spirit can come and walk. Things that have gone wrong this year, you can carry them. You can carry old habits, old sins, old failures, old disobedience. Father, we stand here, we bring repentance on everyone, for everyone, for every pastor, for every leader, for every church worker, for every person, for every church, for every defilement of the people. Father, we bring repentance, we bring the blood of Jesus as an atonement. For every omission, for every sin of commission, for every wrong thought, for every wrong motive, for every wrong words, for every wrong action and wrong deeds, for where we didn't do what we know we should do, for where we we did what we know we shouldn't do, we bring repentance. We bring repentance. We bring the blood of Jesus as an atonement, as the propitiation for our soul. Father, let your fire be lit on the altar of every heart. <laughs> let the fire be ignited on the altar of every heart. Let the eyes salve be applied on every eyes and your anointing upon every ear, upon every mind, upon every heart. That your people will be able to assess the things of God. For it is written to you, it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Let the heavens be opened. Let there be established communication, unbroken communication between heaven and earth, between us and your throne. Everyone that is ministering in one form or the other, I ask for the power of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross to sanctify every one of them. That they will be able to minister. As holy vessels unto you. Those that are ministering in music, those that are leading prayers, those that are ministering in the word, those that are doing one thing or the other. Let your glory tabernacle upon us in this place. Let your terror surround us in this place. But I ask for angels to be released. Far more angels than we will be able to number. To begin to minister your counsel and your will to everyone. To begin to minister your full counsel and your will. Everything that Jesus has died and paid for. That it will be unleashed without fail in the lives of your people. 
we position ourselves in meekness with humility with brokenness to receive from your presence Lord speak for thy servant here open our eyes that we might see you that we might know you open our hearts that we might know you Nobody is truly qualified to lead worship until you are you understand how to pray. Nobody is truly qualified to be in the choir until you understand how to pray. You don't join choir. You join prayer ministry first before you can join the choir. Nobody is qualified to preach until you understand how to pray. You don't become a pastor. You become an intercessor before you can become a pastor. Nobody is qualified to walk in any office in the church until you know how to pray. You don't join these things. You don't join them. The carelessness of people who can pray is what is holding the church as crippled ministries of many churches. The highest form of carelessness is spiritual ones. Once you are careless about holy things, once you are careless about sanctuary matters, you are finished. You don't qualify to play a keyboard because you have talent. You don't qualify to play that drum. You should be afraid to come here and play. You should be afraid. You can die standing on that stuff. You don't come out with all your filthiness and walk into God's presence and just behave like things are normal. You don't do that. There's a friend of mine I respect so much. One time we were in a meeting and he was the speaker. And the time was getting for him to go and speak. He said, he said, he said, he said, brother David, help me tonight go and minister in my place i said why he said i'm not fit i have message prepared i have done all my studies but i'm not fit to go on that pulpit i i and the holy spirit said take note that's a man that fears god i'm not fit not that i don't have my message i'm not fit no fit for ministry tonight. He said, by tomorrow I think I'll be alright. Please, I need somebody else to pour water on my soul. Because there are things that the blood washes, but there are things that the world washes. The blood may wash away your sin, but it's the word that washes away your thoughts, your mind. The blood can purge your conscience, but it's the word that purges your mind. You renew your mind. You wash it. By the word. That's why the scripture teaches us to meditate on it. Day and night. That's why we need to hear it. You don't just hear the word to learn. You hear it to be clean. It's a water. Just like you don't plead the blood just to be protected. It produces protection. But you also plead it to be cleansed. Now, every other thing that God has promised us that has to do with the office of the king. The kingly ministry. Because we're in the season of the kingdom. Dominion is one of the things that God is granting his people in these days. It's predicated on our ability to function in the office of the priest. There is no rulership without the priestly ministry. The throne is weak and helpless without the altar. Anybody that doesn't have an altar has no functional throne. You only have the talk. Dominion, dominion. Talk. You have no. Any 
king you know, any king you know that is a strong king has an altar that backs him up. In heaven, when God sits on his throne, there is an altar with fire on it before him. Fire never goes out on that altar. And when he asked Moses to create a tabernacle for him, he said, also put an altar in front of the mercy seat. The throne itself is, is even an altar. The throne of God, God sits on top of blood. He sits on top of sacrifice. Anybody that has no altar, has no dominion, has no power. You are powerless. You've heard it. A prayerless Christian is a power. It's true. You don't have an altar. You are a weakling. The forces of darkness can mesmerize you any day. Can blow you out. You are as powerful as your altar. And your altar is, is as powerful as the service you carry out on it. The sacrifices you offer on it. A weak altar makes a weak person. You don't just become strong on your own. Spiritual strength is not an, an abracadabra thing. It's not a bravado thing. Spiritual strength is a product of an altar that speaks. You have an altar that has been serving. Now, 2010 can come under control if all of us can take these two, three days and get our altar organized. That's the first thing Elijah asked for when he wanted restoration for the nation of Israel. He said, let's rebuild the altar of the Lord that has been broken down. Because there is nothing. You can't help the king without an altar. You can't save the king without an altar. You can't get victory in battle without an altar. You can't control your finances without an altar. You can't take care of demons without an altar. You can't, you can't rule without it. The greatest resource you must protect in your life is your altar and the priest. That's why I'm sorry for anybody that doesn't have understand his, the spiritual relationships that God has placed in our lives. I don't care who you are. I don't care how whatever you, I don't care. If you like, become the governor. They will slaughter you on the throne. He can, 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 can finish you up. I think once he was a governor on this state, he would get arrested and be slapped, locked up sometimes in toilet. Being a governor doesn't mean anything. And what is behind you is the issue. What kind of power that backs you up? That's why you notice a lot of people, the moment they, they, they get exposed to these offices, they start running to satanic priesthood. Who raises a demonic altar for them? Because wealth attracts more danger. Power attracts more danger. Influence attracts more danger. If you are thinking about ruling in life, the higher you want to go, make build an altar that has enough strength to back it up. Have a priest that can cover you. You maintain a relationship with your altar. You maintain a relationship with your priest. What kind of relationship do you have with your altar? Sacrifices that are born on it. What kind of relationship do you have with your priest? Honor. Sacrifices that you give to the priest. You don't have a relationship with priests in mouth. You don't say this one is my pastor. He's one that covered me. It doesn't work like that. There are people who are dying with pastors. Strong pastors over them. It, something happened. PM. Something happened on 25th. 25th December. This, I think it's a couple of days ago. One evening, you know, I, I was studying on certain things. I was doing research. I was writing a book which I'm releasing next year. So most of this season, I was much. I, I studied on studying and studying until my whole back was spinning me every part. And I have, I will get down from the chair, table and lie on my back, on, on the back, read like this till I get tired on my tummy, on my side, on my so final pastor Sarah comes to the study and I was talking to her I said no wonder the Bible said those who teach in the word are worthy of double honor whatever you give others give them double they give other ministers those who unveil God's truth are worthy of double honor what we mean by honor is not honor I, I honor you is means cooler honor financial material honor now so I was talking with her I said no wonder do you know that Moses did 40 days fast three times? I used to think it was two until I read the account recently again. It was three times so. 40, 40 days. Sit down in one place. 
So young Joe shakes like this. Billy Graham, you know, Pope John Paul, you know, they call it holy, holy disease. So he told us how he's been shaking, how he used fourth dimension to subdue the thing, and the thing stopped. And when he explained it, he said everybody knows he's been talking and shaking him, and the first man to get dominion over Parkinson's disease because he has no cure. What controls the world outside me is inside me. It's not outside. No matter what is happening around me, what controls it is inside. It's inside. There is a regulator. There is a regulator. There is something. <laughs> there is something called. There is something called the peace of God. There is something called faith. There is something called substance of things hoped for. There is something called. There is a force that rules this world. It's in the soul of a true believer. I said, if you don't have an altar that protects, an altar that covers, life is like this. Oh. You just said you saw somebody next thing is like this. But I said, Satan, let me make it clear to you. You can't kill me by plane crash. You can't kill me by drowning. You can't kill me with bullets. You can't kill me with accident. When I finish my life, I'm going to die I'm going to sleep and die with a smile on my face. I said, there's only other one type of death I accept. Apart from this. Martyrdom. For the sake of Jesus Christ. For any other thing, no. For Jesus Christ and his God. Here is my neck. But as for me, if you like, fly, tumble a car 200 times. You won't have a scratch on my body. There is a place called the secret place of the Most High. All of us must hide ourselves inside that place. So, the days are evil. I don't have time to give you talk about end time and what is ahead and the things that are coming. But I have come here with a word from God that will put you in a place there is a foundation that God has laid in Zion. There is nobody that stands on it that can be moved. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There is a hiding place. There is a hiding place in God. Don't live your life by chance. Don't move into another year and start telling stories. And become another story. Somebody will say, ah, that sister, she came for poverty. No, no, no. no. Mm -mm. There is no guesswork in this thing. No. When I have it, I know I have it. When I don't, I know I don't have it. So I, and I also know what to do to get it back. I just want to say Baba You may be seated. I think I need to provide this uh, direction tonight. So tomorrow who can get into serious business. Now, you need to put your altar in place. And you service the altar with sacrifice and you service the priest with sacrifice. Those are the two most important things you need. You can be reigning in life anyhow. You can be reigning in life. There are four types of sacrifices we offer. One is sacrifice of times giving praise and worship. An altar that doesn't have it is dried of the dews of heaven. The, the law of the spiritual world states that if incense is not rising up, rain is not coming down. And rain is symbolic of the blessings of God. So if these things are not going up, then you are looking for trouble. The, the, the outpouring of God's spirit, the outpouring of his blessing, the outpouring of 
of, of his all kinds of things is not coming. The second sacrifice you offer on the altar. So I just want to mention it so we can get up and start doing what we should do. You know. Um, it's prayers. Prayers. Prayer is the economy of the kingdom of, of God. Your government, Nigerian government, runs on tax. We don't take tax seriously yet in Nigeria. They will with time. Lagos State is taking it very seriously. Internal revenue is almost like um, a redundant ministry. The reason is because they are enjoying oil wealth and are ignoring that. But um, every government operates by collecting revenue from the citizens. And that revenue is what they use to now administer uh, what some people call dividends of democracy. But it's not only in democratic system that you collect revenue. In all systems of government, you do. But with that, they provide amenities for the people. So when people cry to the government and say, we don't have good roads, we don't have uh, electricity, we don't have good schools, the government also say to the people, you also have social uh, responsibility to your, to your government or to your society. You have to pay tax so that we'll be able to provide for you what you are asking for. The kingdom of God can provide for all our needs, but there's only one revenue they require from earth. It's prayer. Now, what it means is that wherever you see God failed, it's not God that failed, it's prayer that failed. Anywhere you see that God did not do what he was supposed to do or what he promised that he was, he was going to do, it's not God that failed, it's man that failed. Prayer is earthly license for heavenly interference. If God does not get that revenue from the earth, he does not intervene. You have to understand it because, uh, let me put it this way. The greatest resource on earth are spiritual. The greatest wealth are spiritual. The highest level of poverty is spiritual poverty. The greatest type of losses is when you lose spiritual treasures. So a man is a wealthy man who has prayer stored ahead of his problems. Don't let problem meet you and then you start crying out. Let it be that prayer has gone ahead of your problem. And has actually taken care of them. It's like a man that has immunization before he got infected. By the time the, the, the virus or the bacteria is entering the body, there is already an antivirus in the system ready to eat it up. And those antivirus just feeds on the virus and it cancels the. That's what prayer does. When Jesus saw ahead of time, in the place of prayer, it's in the place of prayer that you see the future. It's in the place of prayer that you understand the, the present. It's in the place of prayer you can also benefit from the past. You mine out the treasures from the past. There are a lot of wisdom that can be derived from some of the things that have happened to you in the past, but some of us will keep repeating history because we never learn from it. Because prayer... Among all the many things it does, imparts wisdom and understanding. It opens the mind to see things clearly. It unclogs the mind. It removes the, the spider waves, you know, so to say. It removes the, the veil that blocks your sight. It's in prayer that you get correct perspectives on issues. On life. When I don't pray, I don't see. 
when I don't pray, my understanding is distorted. It's myopic. I become short-sighted. It's in prayer I gain foresight. It's also in prayer I gain hindsight. If God does not get that revenue, he does not intervene. And that law operates on two levels. It operates for individuals. And it operates for nations. He also operates for institutions. At the individual level, just like you can't draw on empty accounts, you can't walk up to the bank and say, my friend, you just gave my friend one million. Give me one million. It doesn't work like that. What the bank gives you depends on what you deposited. That's how it is with prayer. Prayer should be stored up ahead of time. Prayer is not something you do because there is a problem. Prayer is something you do. <laughs> Even when there is no problem. You do it to solve problems, but you also do it to prevent problems. Certain problems. Jesus said, pray that you enter not into temptations. Prayer is tougher when it becomes an emergency. Your car is already tumbling. Then you are shouting, name of Jesus, name of Jesus. You can ask Pastor Sarah. I, most of the time when I'm in a, a difficult situation, I, I hardly shout. The only time I speak is when I command peace be still or rebook a storm but most of the time because I know that I should shout if I check inside me there is no peace it's time to scream call for emergency but no matter what I meet it doesn't move me because most of the time God prepares me ahead of time he puts me in order the power that controls your world is not outside you, it's inside you. <laughs> it's inside you. The power that controls your world is inside you. It's the force of your faith. It's with God's faith that he created the world. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3, by faith we understand. We understand that the world was framed by the word of God. The power that rules your world is inside you. You exercise it when you speak. You exercise it when you pray. How many of you will want to be in charge of your world and not just let things happen to you and, and let your life run out of control? How many of you would like to have your life under control? The way to do it is with your words and with your prayers. When you are prayerless, your world is out of control. Your life is like a vehicle on speed without a driver. When you are prayerful, nothing can happen to you by accident. Nothing. And no matter what comes up, it's under control. The high hand of God will be involved. Because prayer is what brings in divine partnership. A man that prays enjoys angelic fellowship, angelic protection, angelic provision, angelic assistance and help. There's so many things that happen that go along with that. Prayer can generate cash. You may not have connection, have prayer, have divine connection. It can take care of many things. Uh, a wise man has said the only thing prayer cannot do is what God cannot do and I don't know what it is I don't know what it is everything bows on the altar of prayer that altar controls everything controls everything I think that's why the songwriters said prayer is the key prayer is the master key because it's the access to God's omnipotence God's power is a resource it's only prayer that draws it 
is a resource. An inexhaustible resource. So the kingdom of God runs on that currency. If, if God, heaven does not get it, heaven does not intervene. And God will be watching like these things will be going wrong. And you know, a lot of things have gone wrong and people wonder, they say, God, why? So the, one of the popular ones is, why me? Of course. Why not you? When you are prayerless. Some of you have been living on other people's prayers. They've been giving you checks and you've been cashing. Because your account is empty. You have a praying mother, a praying sister, a praying brother who always puts a covering over you. So you've been getting by. But how can you keep running on a red account when this thing is available to all? Jesus gave us a promise. Maybe I should read it for you. John chapter 14. Uh, uh, if you don't believe it, it shows because you probably don't use it. Verse 13. Whatsoever you ask in my name, I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Chapter 16. Verse 24. Oh, let me read from verse 23. In that day, you will ask me nothing. Verily I say unto you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive. That your joy may be full. I know how some of you will feel now if you win a contract. They say you just won a contract 20 million. Another person who won a contract 200 million. Or somebody just gave you a check and you turned and looked at it. Wow! Five million. He said, ah, can you imagine? Nobody has ever given me five million in my life. Jesus just gave you an open check and said, fill in something inside. And after a while, he came back to them. He said, you have asked nothing in my name. You don't know what my name is. My name is God's legal tender. It's a checkbook. The only one the bank of heaven recognizes. You can write on any other paper. They don't recognize it. My name. My name. I have given you my name. Use it to approach the Father for anything. He said to you, have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive. That your joy may be full. This is my experience. I don't have prayer failures. You don't want something to happen. Don't ask me to pray for you. Because I will get it for you. It's true. I have such impeccable faith in my prayer. I just can't explain it. Maybe tomorrow I will tell you how I develop such faith and show you how you can have it. I have such an impeccable faith on my prayer. God hears my prayer. Why? Because I believe this invitation he has given. I believe it. I believe the man that said this. I know that when somebody gives a check, the, the, you can doubt him. You can doubt if that check can turn to cash. If you're not sure that that man has enough resource to back up what he has given. When I walk by sight, nothing works. I have to get back. It's faith all the way. You can't start by faith and graduate by sight. Mm -mm. You get demoted. His faith work, the Christian work is a faith work. You believe God and you prevail. You stop believing Him, you sink. I, I used to believe last year, this year, I don't know 
you are going to sink this year. If you don't pull out your faith, it's your life jacket. Oh. It keeps you afloat. If you don't pull it out and put it on, you sink. You, say, ah, you have developed cynicism. You've developed all those whatever along the way. Remove them. Those are some of the things I was praying about at the beginning. Atonement for your soul. All those things that have blocked you up, clear them out of the way. If you drop your faith, you drop your life. Because the just shall live by faith. And we die by unbelief. It's your faith that will get you into heaven. It's unbelief that will send you to hell. When you read the list of those who, who, who go to hell, the one, top on the list, the, uh, one of the, the unbelieving. Everyone said the unbelieving. They even included, one translation included another list. He said the cowardly. Cowards. That's the fearful. That's what some translation will call it. Fear drowns you. Faith keeps you afloat. Unbelief drowns you. It's not the circumstance of life that finishes a believer. It's whether his faith is up or down. So the reason you service the altar of your heart is to keep your faith alive. Because there are things that come to meddle with it. You must keep them out. You have to keep those things out. You have to take note of what they are. Your greatest enemies are the enemies of your faith. Your greatest loss, losses are spiritual. They are not material. Amazingly, we will cry if we lose a car, if a, if a thief steals our money, or we will get worried. And some of us don't care when we lose real worlds, which are spiritual worlds. Once you stop praying, the enemy starts stealing you dry. It's when men sleep that the enemy steals big time. One of the reasons the scripture enjoins us to watch and pray, to watch, to be spiritually alert, to be awake in the spirit, is so that we can always spot the devil. We can smell him a thousand miles away and check him immediately. No matter how he tries to sneak in, we can spot him and stop him. But you have power to stop him. You have authority. The worst thing is that he comes in, steals this one, goes. He comes tomorrow, takes this one, goes. He comes tomorrow. And, you know, in spiritual losses, you don't see the result immediately. After some time, the, ah, he said, when the wheat grew, then the tars showed up. You see all the things that the devil has planted. Prayer is God's economy. It's God's kingdom currency. God doesn't accept dollars. He doesn't accept pounds. The currency of heaven is faith. And that faith is transacted in the course of prayer. Transacted in the course of prayer. Anybody that has that currency, you are rich in it. You can translate it. Just like you can change your naira to dollars, you can change dollars to naira. You can translate heavenly currency into material equivalent. You can translate it into whatever kind of currency you use in your country. You can also convert it to any kind of pro needs, solution you, ha you need for whatever problems you have. You know when they say money answered all things? Huh? But you realize that money doesn't necessarily answer spiritual things. But prayer is a form of money. It's a form of currency. Just like Naira does not answer in US. And uh, pounds does not answer in Russia. Your Naira doesn't answer in heaven. The currency is faith. So if I sow seed faith, if I pray in faith, all those things you do in faith can buy anything on that side.
Here is what I'm trying to get to you in a nutshell. You are going to store enough incense. Kalubo, Kolomosos, Kaya, Sirus, Revelation chapter 8. You're going to store up enough incense to cover all the journey, the challenges, the transactions of 2010. You can even go ahead and take care of the next 10 years. Make out time. January is, is usually first fruit month. I think you will be a better person. Your destiny will turn out much better if you will learn to utilize the month of January correctly. Give God first fruit financially. Give him first fruit in terms of time. Find days within that month to concentrate on prayer. Don't just do it for 2010. Do it every year of your life. If you can, always fast the whole month of January. The whole month. Let me see who can manipulate any remaining month against you. You can't. You can't. There are contracts that if you do now, if they pay you now, they say they pay you on January 1st. 215 million. You can decide to sleep the remaining year. Huh? Anybody that is pursuing contracts as into that in 2010, you are going to get all your contracts awarded inside this building. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Whatever, we're not able to finish here because there is, there is prayer hour. There is, you know, the way they measure how many hours you put in at work, uh, man hour, the way they measure hours in other areas, that's how it is, it's also in the area of prayer. You can see that Jesus took care of three and a half years of ministry in 40 days. Don't think he was a fool. He said, I'm wasted time. Mm -mm. You are saving time. A lot of wasted time that you are going to bring under control. So you don't rush off. Say, I'm going to Abuja. When you get there, they tell you the minister just traveled yesterday. A ticket, all the time wasted, all that. When, when is he coming back? Two weeks' time. You go back. He said, But he gave me an appointment. He said, uh, He just got a directive from the presidency. Even him, he didn't know he, would be, he was going to travel. Low. But in prayer, everything that concerns you, God will arrange it. Oh, yeah. oh. Revelation chapter 8. Verse 1. He opened the seventh seal. There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Even in heaven, they measure time. You know, some people say it's eternity. Even eternity is calibrated. It's calibrated. It's endless past to endless future. But they don't just roll it at once. Just keep it rolling. It happens like here. It happens like here. You are back to December. You are about to enter January. That's calibration. That's what God did for us. And it's beautiful. You can imagine without a means of knowing where you're coming and where you're going, where you are, it will have been a very terrible mess. Another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. Everyone say altar. If there is one in heaven, there must be one on earth. If not, there won't be connection. So, beginning of every year, a pastor should service the altar of the church. If not, you will say Holy Ghost used to fall last year, this year. You don't know why the ministry is weak this year. Beginning of every year, every believer should service the altar of their heart. When we get to that point where we succeed in establishing national altars. Some of us are building it but a time is coming when it will be recognized by government. A nation should service the national altar. And when you plant a business, plant an institution, a school, you should also plant an altar in the premises. 
I don't mean you go and and maybe raise stone and build something. Not necessary. There are different ways you can do it. If you can, you can build a chapel inside the school. There is no school if I build and it will have its own compound that won't have a chapel. No matter how small. It's not just in a campus that you build. My own secondary school I attended had its own chapel. And we hold our own services. And I was the chapel prefect. And sometimes we invite the priest to come and help us. Other times, we become the small priest. The way the missionaries used to do it is that they would buy land, build school, then build church in the middle. That's how it, you do it. So when you have a company, you know, you company, business, bank, so staff of organization begin the week with prayer. At least, even if it is one day a week, that Monday, beginning of work. I think we do it in our schools now. I don't know about your universities because they don't, but it should be done in your business. Business starts by eight. All staffs report by seven. Thirty minutes. Then certain seasons in the year you do weekend conference. Now what you have done is that you have brought the kingdom of God to the marketplace. Before long, people from other banks, other institutions will be attending fellowship in your own organization. That environment where you have built your company, people customers, other people will be attending and, and in that way after a while you have reached so many people for Christ. The problem is that we separate God from other things that we're doing. But there is no throne that will survive without an altar. The day Satan will, will try it. That is the day he collapses. We see your friends who are in the occult or your enemies, which one are they? Whichever. Some of them are your friends because in the day you think there are normal people like you. They work with you, they live in your yard, they are colleagues in the office. But see him in the night with this red thing. And some of them call your name. They are trying to remove you from your office and take it. Trying to create demotion. All the bad things that happen are things we do not cover with prayer. All the good things that happen are things the altar generated. Those little times you give attention to your altar, that's what created some of the peace, the free atmosphere that you are breathing, the peaceful air that is around you. But you see all this wahala that is around you, there is a spiritual power behind them. You can bring all of them under control. You can bring them under check. Whatever you bind on earth remains bound. And the things you permit by omission or commission, you just allow them. You refuse to take care of them. They, they are permitted. And God will permit you. If you want to go to hell, he can also allow you. Unless another human being stands on the way on your behalf. Unless an, an intercessor, somebody that knows you or somebody just blocks the path. Because we are permitted to save other people's lives. Another angel, having a golden censer, stood at the altar. He was giving much incense. Everyone said much. That's the, 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 the word I wanted to underline. Everyone said much. Don't let your account, your spiritual account, your prayer account ever run dry. God left a commandment in, in the Bible. He said the fire must not go out of the altar. Don't let your seed account ever run dry. I don't know if you actually have a seed account. You don't use tithe for benevolence or welfare. It's not your, your business. Say, no, my 10%, I'm using it to look after the poor. You're a crazy man. God said, bring it to my storehouse.
Very soon now, the devil will move into your account and start using your account to look after the poor. Because you people are very lawless. You just can't stay with the book. He said it's written in Leviticus. He, he, he gave to the poor another. Are you a priest? He said, okay, we are priest and king. There are, we have the priesthood of all believers, but we don't have the eldership of all believers. God set some in the church. First apostles, second prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He didn't say he said all. The way he said the Levitical family. He didn't say the 12 tribes. So, if you claim the priesthood, uh, you can't claim the eldership. You can't claim the presbytery. There is still a holy order. Say we are all priests. I met one crazy guy, very crazy. He used to be my friend, but I think the friendship died that year. Yes. He said, We are all priests. The Bible said, We are all priests and kings. So I pay my tithe to myself. So the priests receive the tithe. I receive this tithe in the name of Jesus. Amen. You go ahead and spend it. I say, You a thief. He ran mad, though. He ran mad in third year. He ran mad. She knows who I'm talking about. He ran mad. Very brilliant guy. I'm very anointed, too. Devol has collected, collected his brains. Till today, self, I, I heard that he didn't graduate. Because even when he recovered from that one, a lot of other problems. Even the priests themselves pay tithes. Even Abraham, that is the father of everything, pay tithes. The you that is the seed of Abraham is one eating it. Your father paid tithe, you the son. Your father is Abraham, he paid tithe. You the seed. Where did you he said if you Abraham's seed, you do Abraham's work? Where did you get your own from? When it comes to the good things, you claim Abraham's blessing. When it comes to responsibility, you reject his rest, his works. So much insects. That's what I want us to see. I want us to fill this whole place with incense. You know, it's just that I want to drop a picture, but in the spiritual world, it doesn't happen like that. But I want to paint a picture that we we'll fill this room with so much incense that <laughs> by this time next year they have not finished ascending. But that's not the truth. It's not a picture of truth. He's just trying to use something to paint something for human mind. But it's not a picture of truth. Spiritual incense. <laughs> As it's coming out of your mouth. You know, last year when we were here, uh, the fire of God fell and prayer was going on. One of the sessions, my eyes were open. I think I was there. And I saw this incense. Hmm. 